Hi, everyone. Yes, as Ian said, I'm uh, Lucy from the Global Network of Civil Society Organizations for Disaster Reduction. And that is such a mouthful that we have a, a handy acronym of GNDR, which I'm going to use for the next five minutes because I only have five minutes. Um, do you mind if I take the... There you go. <laughs> um, so what is GNDR? Uh, we are not an implementer. I don't go out and I don't go, and I don't go build bridges or flood walls, um, but we are a network of over 850 implementing organizations, 850 NGOs that do go out and do that really important work. So they've all come together and they're big, they're big INGOs you might have heard of, but the majority are small community-based organizations in a uh, village in Kampala, um, for example. And they've all come together to join a network because they recognize that they're stronger together that they, um, we can jointly advocate together with one voice, that we can share knowledge to improve our resilience programming, um, or to work on collaborative disaster risk reduction projects. So we're all interested in building resilience better collaboratively. And I work in a secretariat that supports members to do that. So how does GNDR deliver solutions um, to global challenges? Well, we think a lot of the global challenges need solutions informed by local people. And so we like to think that we are connecting that local to global because it's, it's local people that know the risks they face. They have the critical capacities to address them. For generations and generations, they've experienced it, they've learned, um, they've built skills that we need to utilize at all levels. Um, and we do that in three ways. So we, uh, we work together to influence policy and practice to ensure that they actually do build resilience. You know, they take into account the, the complex, multi-hazard, informal situations that people live in. Um, and we, do, we support this by, I go out and I listen to our members and then I feed that up to um, at global and regional events. That is facilitated by the fact that GNDR is um, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction's NGO focal point. So we do have a seat at these very exclusive climate meetings, these disaster meetings. So we can bring that local voice up to the global level. But we also build advocacy capacity to help them to advocate on, on their own behalf to their national governments. We also uh, build collaborative capacities between different actors. Um, we organize collaborative workshops. Um, we have simulations we organize to bring together local government representatives, NGOs, community members, private sector, to get people talking about how they can build resilience together. Uh, and we also create and share knowledge between us, which we facilitate by organizing South-South exchanges between people, um, workshops, online learning markets. Um, and I'm going to explain just in a little bit of depth two very interrelated programs that we've worked that have evolved from each other um, to show exactly how we are building resilience together. So the first one is Views from the Frontline. And um, so Views from the Frontline is a, is a local monitoring program that we have been running. And basically, we weren't happy with how national governments were reporting on how they were trying to reduce disaster risk. They were being told by the UN that they had to self-assess their own work, and they were just being able to tick and say, oh, yes, we've designed a DRR policy, so we're, we're great, 10 out of 10, and they gave, them that score, gave themselves that score. And we weren't happy with that, because they weren't actually going down and seeing what was happening in the communities and whether that risk was reducing. So we, we did it. And we did it for every two years. Um, and we assessed uh, against the indicators of the global UN DRR policy. And we asked local people what they thought. And um, what we found, we did it in 2009, 2011, 2013. Um, and what we found was what one community member called clouds but little rain, was that, yes, at the national level, they were implementing these DRR policies. They were designing, sorry, these DRR policies, but none of it was trickling down to impact on the ground. It was a very different picture from what people were reporting. Um, and so we, uh, and in fact, we actually found that disaster losses were increasing, in particular for different groups, persons with different disabilities, children and youth, um, and a lot of small-scale disasters were being ignored. They were, they were invisible. They weren't being reported. Um, so these are our reports from our subsequent things. I've got a couple of copies back at the, at the back there. Um, and so we, we were able to feed up these local perspectives, 
into global reporting on disaster risk um, and try and influence the, the next big global policy that came out to make sure that local people were being included. Um, we actually got two major comments back from the communities after this Views from the Frontline program. One was that these questions you're asking us, these, these indicators of a global framework, they mean nothing to us. These aren't the relevant questions for us. So we then actually evolved into a new program called Frontline where we, we changed the questions from being set by at the global level to ask more open-ended questions. Um, so this is just an introduction to Frontline. What are the priority threats that you face? What are the consequences of those threats? What actions are required to address these threats? And what do you think are the barriers that are preventing the reduction of this risk? And we also critically in this version of the program, as well as collecting this information, we also then went and reflected on this information with the communities and worked with them to act on the information. And so that's what we have been doing for the last three years. Um, and we've also been collating all of this data together into an open source database that you can disaggregate um, by age, by gender, by disability, by income level, by education. Um, and anyone can use it. And we want as many people using it as possible. Um, so these are actually the actions that women in Tonga think are needed to reduce flood risk. These are the barriers as uh, prioritized by children in Nepal, I think, to, uh, to children and youth, yeah, um, to reduce disaster, no, no, reduce disasters in the Philippines. You'll see that number one there, you might not be able to read it, that this, sorry, this is the barriers to reduce uh, disasters in the Philippines as prioritized by children and youth. Number one is, is the fact that there's poverty. You know, that's the biggest barrier. Number two, lack of access to um, technology. We've got government instability. Some really interesting local perspectives coming through there. So um, what, what have we actually then achieved through this? So we've collected all this information and we've then helped people at different levels to use it. And so this woman here is from Indonesia and she did this amazing thing where she mobilized her whole community to put together a really impactful presentation where they went and met with their government and said, look, we've collected all this information. This is what your citizens are saying. This is the priority threat. This is what needs to be done. You're actually doing something very different. Um, we think you need to change your policies. And they did. The Indonesian government did change their ways. And they not only did they change that policy and that plan, but they actually now systematically go to that woman and that community to ask what she thinks each time they need a revision. Um, this is in Cameroon, where after they collected the information, the communities then organized a meeting with their local government and some small medium enterprises and said, look, it's clear that the biggest problem here is that waste is being dumped in this lake, in this, yeah, in this lake. And one simple thing could be, we just need to dredge it. We just need to dredge this lake. But we can't do it, as in, like, we as NGOs can't do it. We as community members can't do it alone. But they all chipped in, and they actually hired this uh, digger to come and dredge it. So that was a real physical impact that we saw. Um, and this is another one from Indonesia, where uh, the community realized, after they'd sort of collected and reflected on this data with different actors, that it wasn't the fact that um, earthquakes were happening relatively regularly. That wasn't their priority. For them, it was actually the, the fact that they were being asked to relocate because of that to areas where um, they didn't have a livelihood. And that was the priority threat for them. That's what they cared most about. So they actually decided to set up in their community um, disaster tourism. So they set up uh, and invited people from around the world, and people from around the world come and and, and see and see how they live and how they live with the, the risk that they, that they have and how they try and adapt it. And they put on these great shows. Um, so that was just a, a very quick summary of a couple of our projects that we do. And we want as many people to be using this local information to, in their work to actually build resilience effectively. So that's what GNDR does. Thank you.